Do you ever just look at your recent videos and say, I may have gone too far in a few places? Because, yeah, sometimes it seems like all I ever do is complain. Mostly about Disney, huh? Go figure. But let's be positive for a change. In fact, let's talk about why Shrek 2 is actually one of the greatest sequels of all time. No, I'm not memeing you. I'm dead serious this time. Most people love this movie. Some even love it more than the first. But I don't think anyone ever takes a look at it and says, Oh yeah, now that's one of the greatest sequels in cinematic history. Why am I Luigi? But here's the thing. It totally is one of the greatest sequels in cinematic history. Now, I know what you're thinking. Whoa, whoa, back it up. There's no mm. such thing as a perfect movie. And to that, I say... You are correct, sir! There's no such thing as a perfect movie, but there is such a thing as a perfect sequel. All right, you guys really gotta stick with me on this one. This is probably the most TED talking my channel will ever get. So if you understand this next bit, you have a high enough IQ to understand the genius of Shiny. Congrats. <laughs> So, as I said, there's no such thing as a perfect movie. Even my favorite movie of all time isn't perfect. I mean, what happened to the folder? What happened to the folder after Neiman put it down? This isn't funny, Damien Chazelle. This is gonna bug me for the rest of my life. Where did the folder go? So yeah, like I said, there are no perfect films. There's simply too many variables at play. Directing, acting, cinematography, score, editing, effects, production design, writing, pacing, characters, Tamatoa. Every single one of these elements needs to be perfect in order to craft a perfect film. And it can't be done. However, the criteria for a perfect sequel is a lot more achievable. As a result, a movie can perform its functions as a sequel perfectly, even if it can't be a perfect movie. So, what's the criteria for a perfect sequel? Here's what I decree it is. Number one, expand the universe of the first film in meaningful ways. Two, continue the story in a new compelling way. Three, introduce new compelling themes or expand on the themes of the original. And four, leave an undeniable impact on your franchise. A few examples of perfect sequels include Empire Strikes Back, Aliens, The Dark Knight, Blade Runner 2049, and Toy Story 2. All of these films meet the criteria for a perfect sequel, and in my opinion, all of them are a much better film than their predecessor. Except Alien, those two are basically equal. So let's go over that criteria I laid out and determine why these movies do everything a sequel should, and more. Expanding. The universe. Aliens introduces new concepts about xenomorph biology, a deeper look at the Whaling Corp, and a much more intricate look at Ripley's life and her as a character in general. All of the things introduced in this movie fit so naturally into the alien universe that it feels like these concepts were here from the start. Of course there's an alien queen. Of course the aliens incubate their victims like this. Of course mech suits. Of course weird giant Mars rovers. Everything in this movie feels like a natural progression of the first movie's world. I could also talk about Blade Runner at this point, but we don't have 18 hours, so let's move on. Continuing the story in a new, compelling way. And introducing new, compelling themes. Blade Runner 2049 takes the introspective themes of the first film, such as identity, humanity, artificiality, etc., and gives them all a much more thorough explanation, while also telling a more compelling story that allows for many more chances to develop all these themes. The Dark Knight shifts the focus to new characters and gets a chance to explore brand new themes of morality, chaos, justice, etc., and Toy Story 2 raises far more interesting questions than the first. What happens when a toy's owner grows up? Will they be forgotten, and is it worth it to go through that? These questions are then directly followed through on in the third movie. Which leads me to leaving an undeniable impact on the rest of the franchise. Empire Strikes Back is the textbook example. Every major plot beat in the entire series revolves around the twist in this movie. It entirely changes the trajectory of Luke and Vader's character arcs in the next movie. The entire point of the prequels is explaining how this twist came to be. The theme of family permeates the entire Star Wars saga, and it wasn't the first movie that caused this, it was the sequel. In addition, the amount of iconic fan-favorite characters the sequel introduces is unreal. Yoda, Palpatine. Lando, and this guy whose name you all know, and it starts with a B. Trash. Yes! Now before we get into Shrek 2, I want to quickly go over decent and bad sequels. Deadpool 2 is by all accounts a pretty good movie, better than the first. But is it a pretty good sequel? Mmm, I'd argue that it's only a decent sequel. Despite being better in nearly every way, it still feels all too familiar, with a lot of recycled jokes and bits from the first. Too much fan service ain't good fam. In addition, the tone hasn't really changed much. 
Aliens and Empire are exciting and rich because of their unique tones compared to the first film. This is just more Deadpool. I feel mostly the same watching these two movies, despite the latter's improvements. Essentially, Deadpool 2 is a Galaxy 2 kind of sequel, while Empire Strikes Back is a Majora's Mask kind of sequel. Both good, better than the originals even, but one's trying a lot harder to be a different, mm, richer experience. And then there's bad sequels. I have two examples that I hold in equally low esteem, Cars 2 and The Last Jedi. These two are the worst kinds of sequels for different reasons. Cars 2 is a worthless side story that doesn't follow up on anything that made the original decent, and its events are completely ignored by Cars 3. It left no impact on the franchise, and it expanded the world of Cars in completely idiotic ways. The Last Jedi, meanwhile, feels like a fanfiction written by a pretentious high school student who only read the Wikipedia plot of the previous movie. Its connections to Force Awakens are tenuous at best, its themes of failure are designed to actively frustrate the viewer, and it does very little to advance the story or develop any characters, aside from its villain of all people. Shrek as a franchise is obviously no stranger to bad sequels, but what's incredible is that DreamWorks managed to sidestep every possible problem a sequel could have, and hit that criteria I laid out perfectly in its first outing. Shrek 2 is obviously not a perfect movie. And what does she find? Some gender-confused wolf. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, she's evil, so it's okay for her to be intolerant, I guess. That's why she gets murdered at the end. Problem solved. I don't feel so good. So, yeah, this is not a perfect movie. However, it is most definitely a perfect sequel. And hey, let's talk about that. Shrek 2 features such a perfect expansion of the first movie's story, characters, and world that it blows my mind. The story proceeds in such a natural way and answers so many questions that the first movie might have left us with. Fiona's a princess, right? Okay, of... Where? What kingdom does she belong to? Who were her parents and why did they leave her in that tower? Who are her people? Who are your people? I don't have people. No people, huh? Fiona... Mm, solo. The movie expands upon all these questions in a way that makes complete sense. Having it all be a ploy by a manipulative fairy godmother in order to get her son a future bride, all in exchange for the happily ever after she promised King Harold, who also happens to be the Frog Prince, which is also foreshadowed over the course of the film. Don't you remember when we were young and, oh, we used to walk down by the lily pond and they were in bloom? Our first kiss. That's amazing. To quote my 12th grade government teacher, who also kind of looks like a white Shrek now that I think about it, it all comes together like a beautiful tapestry. Much like Blade Runner 2049, Shrek 2 lets you rethink the events of the first film with all the new revelations it gives you. What? But at the same time, it offers a completely satisfying standalone story, unburdened by a need to know what happened in the first film. This is a very satisfying standalone and follow-up story, complete with twists, turns, and dare I say it, LAYERS! The opening narration sets the stage pretty well, echoing the same story the first film opened with, but with new details and a mysterious new narrator instead of Shrek. The movie is wasting no time in expanding the Shrek universe and getting you intrigued to learn more about it. We see tons of new locations that feel completely different from the places we went to in the first film. There's a lot of magic spells and potions that enhance the world building. These concepts weren't really explored too much in the first film, but they're front and center here and it feels organic. We'll get to themes later, but does this movie leave an undeniable impact on the franchise? Bruh. I am the franchise. Far Far Away is the main setting of the series from this point on. Everything that happened in the first film might as well have been forgotten. Lord Farquaad is some nobody who had no real presence as a villain, just a joke. Fairy Godmother is a compelling antagonist who's implied to be behind Fiona's curse in the first place, and her impact is felt in-universe and in real life, apparently. And just like Empire, the newcomers here are fan-favorite mainstays. Puss in Boots, The King and Queen, Prince Charming, Doris, voiced by Larry King. The supporting cast is so good, you guys, oh my god! Okay, so Shrek 2 hits all the criteria. It's a perfect sequel, I convinced you guys, hooray, we're done here. Vroom, back in the 90s, I was in a- No. I'm not done explaining what makes this movie so good. Get out your 2004 era MP3 players and log into N N Napster? I, 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 I don't know, it's the music, we're gonna talk about the music now. The soundtrack of Shrek 2 is, in a word, phenomenal. It accomplishes so much in terms of setting the tone, enhancing the story, and making me forget how much I hate Footloose. Damn you, Shrek 2! You maniac! 
Seriously though, is it safe to say that Shrek 2 not only has the better version of holding out for a hero, but it uses it in the story in a much better way? Like in Footloose, it's just there. Without any real reason for it to be sung, she's just singing about a hero. Just because. For no reason. Here, it ties into the story so naturally and it blends so well with the score that it's not even a contest. Shrek 2 makes such perfect use of the song that it's associated primarily with this movie. Obviously, this is the big example everyone likes to point to, and we'll discuss it later, but let's talk about how every other song in this soundtrack is perfectly implemented and enhances the scene. I think people take for granted just how important the soundtrack is to a Shrek movie. It's a lot like Guardians of the Galaxy in that regard. The pop culture songs are integral to Shrek's identity and they help make the series what it is. For instance, the main goal of the first Shrek soundtrack is essentially... <gasps> Get that away from me! You know I'm allergic to defenses of The Last Jedi. But yeah, Shrek 1 delivers a song meant to let the audience know this ain't your grandma's fairy tale. The entire tone of the movie is made explicitly clear through one magical little compound word. Some. Once you hear Smash Mouth, you know exactly what this movie is gonna be. It's an edgy take on fairy tales and it doesn't give a damn about its bad reputation. He said the big word. Take a pop. As the movie slows down and really starts to examine the blooming relationship between Shrek and Fiona, the songs start reflecting that. From the one no one remembers, to Hallelujah, to the song with an opening so perfect it feels like it was written for this story. I thought love was only true in fairy tales. It's such a solid soundtrack with an explicit and strong connection to the story it's trying to tell. Take these amazing songs out, and the story doesn't work quite as well. This is why I think Shrek the Musical is complete garbage, but we'll talk about that another day. What's amazing is the fact that Shrek 2 takes the concept of pop culture musical storytelling from the first movie, says, nah, that sucked, and improves it tenfold. The only movie I can think of that incorporates pop culture music into its story better than this is Baby Driver. And if I'm talking about a movie in the same breath as Baby Driver, that's how you know, okay, this is a pretty good movie. The central theme of this movie is exploring the relationship between Shrek and Fiona. This comes across so perfectly with Accidentally In Love, which is a jam despite being the most early 2000s song I've ever heard possibly. Is there no better way to describe Shrek and Fiona's relationship than Accidentally In Love? Ever Fallen In Love reflects this perfectly as well while also being a great action song. I Need Some Sleep and People Ain't No Good perfectly reflects Shrek's mindset and the tone of each scene. Funky Town and Little Drop of Poison are the perfect ways to establish new locations. And I I could gush about how David Bowie's changes is used in this movie for hours. How could this soundtrack be any more perfect? Hit it! <laughs> Oh yeah. The one song I can't seem to wrap my head around is Live in La Vida Loca, which seems more like a random choice thrown in because of popularity, but whatever, it's still a solid way to go out. Plus it's nice to hear Antonio Banderas and Eddie Murphy sing, especially since Mushu was robbed of having his own song. But that's okay, I'm sure he'll have one in the live action remake, right? 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 All in all, if you add up all the songs in this movie, there could be 10. I didn't mention the Fairy Godmother song since it's an original creation and mostly meant as a take that to Disney. Kind of like the Robin Hood song from the first movie. And it's good for what it is. So this is a movie with 10 songs, all ranging from solid to spectacular, with 9 of them serving vital relevance to their scenes and ultimately enhancing the viewing experience. Compare that to Suicide Squad. No, that's too easy. Compare that to Shrek the Third. What is wrong with this movie? I can't make sense of any of the song choices here. Why is Live and Let Die playing at King Harold's funeral? This is a Bond song, you guys. Why is it here? Is it because it has die in the title? Wow, that's really stupid. Thanks so much, guys. I love this movie. Yeah! You really can't appreciate a perfectly integrated soundtrack until you experience a poorly integrated one. So, thanks for that, I guess. Okay, I don't want to think about Shrek the Third anymore. Moving on. This movie's really funny, guys. I, 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 I don't even know what else to say here. Oh, thank you, Mother. Mother! <laughs> Legit, I watched this movie last week and I laughed out loud on numerous occasions. I never laugh out loud at movies unless I'm with an audience, and I wasn't with no audience when I watched this. It is just that funny that I couldn't help myself. The pop culture references are so seamlessly integrated into the world of this movie that it's incredible. Like, I love ya Madagascar, but this is just referencing for references sake. Don, you old heck! <laughs> Comedy. 
Shrek 2 has Friars, Fat Boy, Knights, Far Bucks. Even just the concept of Far Far Away being like LA is brilliant and a great contrast to the locations of the first movie. The jokes and delivery from everyone is top notch. I think my favorite performance in this movie has to be John Cleese. Cheese? Cless? I should look up how to pronounce that before I record this. No, no, I'm okay. That's okay. John Cle Cle Cheese, John Cheese as King Harold. Everything he says just cracks me up. This is Fiona's choice. Yes, but she was supposed to choose the prince we picked out for her. Little details like Prince Charming wearing a Burger King crown, this Cyclops student at the door to the poison apple, these terrified people escaping one Farbucks just to go to another across the street. This movie came out in 2004. Why is that so topical? There are now three Starbuckses on my college campus. Who needs that many Starbucksies? To quote that weird asshole guy from the live action Beauty and the Beast. Isn't one enough? Also, this movie's a way better fairy tale than the live action Beauty and the Beast. Boom, send tweet. I also love the dinner scene and how chaotic it gets. It's the perfect mixture of awkwardness and hilariousness. And I have to say, it's pretty much the best scene in the movie. <laughs> nah, I'm only kidding. Hit it! <laughs> How do you even think of something like this? How is it possible? Who came up with this idea, Jesus? A scene like this shouldn't exist. It is unworthy of us mortals. You can't make a flawless movie, but you can make a flawless scene, and this is it. It's simultaneously hilarious and suspenseful. The stakes are made explicitly clear. If Charming kisses Fiona, she falls in love with him, and it's an instant game over. We're invested in Shrek's plight to stop that kiss and all the close calls in the scene, but good god, it's hysterical too. Mongo's death is so emotionally investing and funny at the same time. I love the part where Charming's about to kiss her and she picks up the rose instead and they keep dancing. I can't get over how well the hero vocals sync up with the action and the underlying score. I can't get over the hero vocals in general. Oh my god, this cover. It's so goddamn perfect and it might be the best thing DreamWorks has ever made. Actually, you know what? It is the best thing DreamWorks has ever made. This scene is better than every scene in The Prince of Egypt. I'm not joking. Prince of Egypt is the better overall movie, but this individual scene outdoes every individual scene of this movie. Also, it's a better scene than the Lightspeed Ram. Is that what you people wanted to hear? Are you, are you happy now? But believe it or not, this sequence, despite being easily the best part of the movie, is not why this movie as a whole is so well regarded. It's a big part of it, obviously, but in my opinion, there's an underlying theme that's allowed this movie to persist in our minds for so long. And to quote a wise old fat guy, you may not have noticed it, but your brain did. The most important reason Shrek 2 is such a perfect sequel is how it carries over the themes of the original and expands on them in a deep, satisfying way. The first Shrek is about a guy who is told time and time again that he is unworthy of being loved. I am unworthy of your love. Society hates him for existing. He is seemingly content with his role as the person everyone hates. He doesn't need anyone. That all changes when he meets Donkey, someone who sees him for who he is as a person. He opens up to Donkey about his frustration with how the world sees him. Or at least, he tries to anyway. You dense, irritating, miniature beast of burden! Ogres are like onions! End of story! Bye bye! See you later! He then meets Fiona and finds out they have a lot in common. He's found someone who could potentially love him after years of assuming he's unworthy of love. So he defies society's expectations of him, confessing his love for Fiona and usurping a kingdom by murdering its ruler, but let's not worry about that! He and Fiona get married and his story comes to a close. It's a happy ending for someone who never thought he'd get one. But to paraphrase a wise old horseman, you can't have happy endings in franchises. Not really. Because if everyone's happy, the show would be over. And above all else, the show has to keep going. You never get a happy ending, because there's always more show. This is where Shrek 2 comes in. Shrek has learned to open up to someone, but he's not ready to face society, and society is not ready to face him. Despite gaining someone's love and affection, he is still not accepted. He's not the son-in-law the king wants. He's not the prince the kingdom wants. He's gotten something he's wanted for so long, and yet society thinks he doesn't deserve it. And his insecurities make him believe that he doesn't deserve it. This is why Shrek 2 speaks to me and so many others. I think we've all been in a position where we second guess ourselves about whether or not we really deserve something. 
Let me tell you, as a musical theater geek who really can't sing, I've gotten part after part in high school and community shows, while my female friends with actual great singing voices get practically nothing. The gender balance in community theater is way off, so I got part after part while my friends maybe got one big role every three years, if they're lucky. I've had at least a named role in every show I've ever been in. Some girls I've met have never had a named role. And I hear how good their voice is, and I just want to say sorry. I want to give them my part somehow, because I know they'd sing it better. And it makes me feel like a joke for even getting that part. I've also held positions in many different organizations, ones I didn't work that hard to get, while my friends tried their hardest to get and still didn't. It makes me feel like garbage for being in a position like that, when I know my friend would do so much better. And then there's romantic connection. I've only really had five or six serious crushes in my lifetime so far, and one of them was on Tamatoa, so I don't think that really counts. I confessed my feelings in one instance, and that led to a relationship, but with the other cases, instead of confessing my feelings, all I could think to myself was, man, I wish I was good enough to be with these people. I know for a fact that I'm not the only person who's experienced this feeling, that sense of doubting yourself, even irrationally at times, because you let your insecurities control your life. And that is why we, as a society, connect so well with Shrek. In the first movie, he doesn't confess his feelings because he misunderstands a conversation between Fiona and Donkey, and he lets his irrational fears get the better of him, realizing only later how foolish that is. And after confessing his love to Fiona, even after seemingly gaining her love and affection back, he still thinks that he is not good enough. He's not the charming prince that this girl was promised all her life. He tries to drastically change himself in order to become the man he thinks she deserves, but he realizes that no matter what, he can't change who he is inside. She's a princess, and you're an ogre. That's something no amount of potion is ever going to change. But that's okay. He learns to be content with who he is because that's the person she fell in love with. To quote Dear Evan Hansen, You don't have to convince me. You don't have to be scared you're not enough. Because what we've got going is good. I should mention that Kung Fu Panda also focuses on the idea of getting something you've always wanted, but ultimately believing you don't deserve it. While this movie is excellent and it handles this idea well, I think Shrek 2 handles it better because Shrek's journey through this movie is more relatable and emotional. Ho remains an optimist, even in the face of constant adversity and rejection from the society he desperately wants to join. That's admirable in its own right, however, Shrek exemplifies the kind of personal growth so many of us experience. We try to change ourselves to be better in certain roles, to be a better performer, a better worker, a better communicator, a better partner. We want to improve, but in the end it's so easy to lose track of who we are, to compromise our identity in order to conform to what society wants us to be. Sometimes we lose hope that it's even worth it. We believe that no matter what, we're not good enough. But we are. You are good enough. Don't let society change anything about you. Be proud of who you are and what you've accomplished. Because no matter who you are, no matter what anyone else says, no matter how much that little voice in the back of your head is telling you that you don't deserve it, it's not true. You deserve to live happily ever after. Wow. Shrek 2 is incredible, guys. DreamWorks movies clearly peaked during 2004. In fact, I think I'll review the other DreamWorks movie that came out that year. I don't remember what it was, but considering how amazing this one is, I'm sure they followed it up with another incredible classic- Dun 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 d